Okay, guys, I'm not in the comic book room. I don't think anybody's going to burst into flames and be disappointed, but, uh, I mean, I'm cooking over here in the kitchen, and I'm kind of keeping, I need to be close just in case. So, I, yesterday, I went with uh, Tim Anderson and Star Anderson to uh, Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and they had a little uh, comic book convention. Let's see if I have it here. And I must have thrown it away. But anyway, it's the Whitfield Comic Book Convention. Uh, I want to say it probably had around 20 dealers, if I had to guess. Uh, you know, a lot of cosplayers. Smaller show, great show, really enjoyed it. I took um, a stack of books down there, sold them for $50 to Shelton Drum. Uh, he is a guy that uh, owns Heroes Aren't Hard to Find down in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. He is the man who originated and runs Heroes Con. And, you know, and he's got tons of friends in the comic book field. He's sort of, for the people in the know, he's a little bit of a legend, you know. And I uh, talked to him for a minute. And I actually was, you know, had this moment where I just kind of looked at him and said, it's so weird to know so much about you and to really meet you. And said, I hope I'm not coming off weird, you know. But, you know, he, he was a cool guy. But out of that $50 uh, that he gave me for the, those books and stuff, fair, drip, fair deal, great guy. Uh, I turned around and I think, give or take a buck or two, uh, $35 for 98 books is what I ended up spending at the con. So I ended up walking out $15 at that place. The admission walked out to $11, so I ended up you know, making money. Okay, so uh, one guy I actually bought a stack of books from. I didn't, you know, I still got a deal for him, but I was kind of in a corner where I was trying to sell my books to him first. I already kind of committed myself a little bit, but I cut the stack in half and got it. Uh, these were originally two dollars a piece, but I ended up um, paying probably. I think I got about. I think I cut about six or seven dollars off of these. Okay, and the first one he was really surprised that uh, it was in the two dollar box. You know, he could. Just, you could just tell he was like, Ugh, you know. But anyway, I got this again. This is my second copy in as many months of X Men. Oh, it's the Uncanny X Men Annual, number fourteen. This came out the same month as. Gambit's other appearance, first appearance in uh, X-Men. Uh, this is also part of the Days of Future Present uh, storyline they had going through a bunch of the annuals during that month. But this is one where people go back and forth, which is the first appearance of Gambit, you know, that X-Men book or the annual. So I have two of these. Uh, great art by Arthur Adams in it. Uh, bought this. This is the first appearance of Speedball, Amazing Spider-Man annual number 22. Then when I took it out of the bag, it's amazing. You can't see it, but when you take it out of the bag, there's this, this coloration going down the side of it. No biggie. You know, still got it. Getting up another mint set of this. The set that I have, um, and I've always picked up an issue here and there, but the, the original 12 issue set is the one that I bought off the spinner rack when I was like 12 years old for, you know, for the whole year and got it. And uh, last... I think it was two years ago I got them signed by Marv Wolfman and George Perez. So now I'm getting another mint copy back. I think I only need two or three more issues and I've got another mint set of Crisis on Infinite Earth. One of my favorite stories of all time. Uh, here's number three, number six, number nine. One of my favorite colors covers. Look at all those villains. And I've been a Black Adam fan since I was like about seven years old when I saw him on a cartoon on Saturday morning, uh, Shazam. A Shazam cartoon. It was a show called Hero High. <laughs> it had live segments and cartoons. It was really cool. But they had Shazam cartoons. And when I saw Black Adam, it was over. Number 11. Really, I needed this one upgraded. Even my original one. Uh, I don't know if a piece of tape or something hit it. But like right in here, there's like two or three spots where tape pulled you know, some of the cover off. These are bone. I'm getting a great collection of bone up. I got on my database online to uh, see how many issues I have. And I haven't put half of my books on there. So I got these also, um, and like I said, my whole lot that I, I said a minute ago, not to repeat myself, it, it, this came to like around 95 books and for around $35. So, you know, after, after you go through everything, you know, these, you know, these were, you know, all under 50 cents or something, you know. Anyway, here's number um, 14. These are all first prints. You know, 15. Got a nice little run going now. 17. I have 16 upstairs. Issue 16 of Bone is my favorite issue of Bone because of the storytelling techniques Jeff Smith did. I talked about those in an earlier video when I met Jeff Smith. Number 46. And then all these are in the 50s, like 51, 53, 54. Uh, there's no number on cover, but, uh, you know, 
the, this type of cover that he did uh, was in the early 50s. I have another one with Rose upstairs. The dragon. Okay. Moving on. Let me see what we got here. Okay, then there was a, one of the last booths I hit. I think I had these straight. Uh, the guy had dollar books, so I ended up getting, I talked him into a deal where I got eight books for five bucks. Um, and, you know, and this was actually some really surprising stuff because a lot of the stuff has never been read. And uh, anyway, the first thing I got, this is from 1995. This is a Legends of the Dark Knight special, Batman Ghost by Jeff Loeb, Tim Sale. This was, I think, the first of an annual thing that they did for Halloween. This one actually takes the Charles Dickens novel and turns it on its head for Halloween with Bruce Wayne's dad, Thomas Wayne, meeting him. And they tell, uh, they tell the Christmas Carol, except on Halloween with Batman. You know, very, very cool. Never been read. I went to open this up. The thing... The thing was a brand new, and it still smelled like it was right off the press. I got this. Uh, I've had this set two, three times. I bought it originally right off the rack at a food line. Well, you know, at a magazine rack at a food line when it was coming out. This was a weekly book, Marvel Comics Presents. This is Barry Winsler Smith telling the origin of Wolverine's adamantium, walking you through it. And this is the last part. I've had this set two, three times. I've had the hardcover. I kind of want to get the hardcover again, but the hardcover did not have all these amazing... Uh, amazing covers that uh, Winsor Smith did. Um, they had, he had four or five, six issues of uh, Jack Kirby, Captain America, and Falcon. But I was watching Money, so I went ahead and grabbed this. This is the first appearance of Artem Zola. This is like my third copy. Captain America 208. Um, getting the Secret Wars 2 crossovers. I'm trying to get a complete set of those. Uh, I think ROM ended around issue 75, give or take an issue. So... Usually, with the way the print runs went back then, they you know, printed less and less and less all the way to the last issue. So this one might be a little tricky to find. Not impossible, but one of the things where, well, damn, I just never see it. You know, X Men Two Hundred Three, Secret Wars Two. I see these, you know, being, you know, a little bit, uh, being uh, sold a little bit more or less there. Yeah, my food's doing fine. And now I had book three of this, and I didn't read it because I didn't have the whole set. This is a prestige format. This came out around 19, I want to say 90, but it's The Great Gil Kane, 1989, and I just assumed it was another book adaption of a fantasy story that um, Roy Thomas did, because Roy Thomas, you know, he's always adapted Conan, um, Elric, Michael Moorcock, you know, all these great guys, and Gil Kane always, to me, felt like anytime he did some fantasy stuff or some post-apocalyptic stuff, you know, he just shined, you know, I mean, anything he did shined, but this is... For some reason, I always thought this was what it was. Well, it turns out this is the Ring of Nibelung. I don't know how to say it. N-I-B-E-L-U-N-G. And it turns out that now that I have, it was four issues, I have number three upstairs, and I found, you know, my missing issues. And what was amazing is that this was exactly the issues I needed. He didn't even have the number three, which cracked me up. But when I got in here and read the introduction to the first one, it turns out this is a Wagner adaption of an opera. Okay, they they did an opera. I mean, the last issue is Twilight of the Gods, so you know it's going to be a tragedy, you know. But it's, it's that's so freaking cool, man. You know, um, Freddie Mercury would have Freddie Mercury would have loved this, man. But uh, you know, it's great Gil Kane art. Just one of those old school guys that I just, uh, you know, they do it for me. Okay, uh, let me look around here. Yeah, those, that's those. Okay, and when you walked out, there was a local comic book shop and in Winston-Salem, and I'm not going to, I, I, I just really wasn't impressed with their stores the second time I've been there and stuff, but anyway, they were giving you uh, a little paper, it says come by the store, you get a free comic, you walk in, they had tons of people around these six to eight boxes, you know, flipping through them, and I found this, um, Silver Sable and the Wild Pack number 23, I thought it was an awful series when it came out, but um, I, I think I hung around maybe the first two, three issues and already saw the writing on the wall. But apparently somewhere in the 20s there's one book that's worth a little bit of money kind of sought out. So I'm assuming it was the Deadpool issue. So I got that for free. Oh, here they are. Yeah. Here's the uh, paper for the next with Winston Salem. I think they do this quarterly. Seems like they just had one back in October. And this is Bring the Flyer to... Well, never mind. You'll know who it is now. Uh, that's the thing you bring and you get the comic. Now the rest of these came out of 50 cent bins and of course I got a stack and I cut a deal. And I had a huge stack. <coughs> I left quite a few things out, so, out that it just kills me. But you know. 
Gotta stay focused. Mm. I start with the Marvel stuff. This is um this is going to be completing some runs. I'm now two issues away from uh, finishing up my John Byrne Fantastic Four run, which I should have done long ago. Fantastic Four 279, an insane Psycho Pirate, uh, Psycho Man story. I mean, it is. Uh, oh man, I flipped through this. Um, wow. I mean, it is insane. There's some brutal stuff in there, man. You know. And Blackout, I think it's his last issue. Jerry Ordway Inks, Al Gordon Return. Uh, just a great, great run on there. Then I got a whole big run of Exiles, right? I think I only need 33 issues of the of the 100. Of the, you know, there's only 100 issues of the first volume. And a lot of people I found out got this confused with the Exiles from the Ultra Ultraverse from Malibu Comics back in the 90s, you know, but... Anyway, this book's always cracked me up because when I was growing up, DC com the way I interpreted. Now, this is a little kid reading comics, okay? Uh, number nine, eight, you know, number nine. Um, I remember reading in the comics. You know, DC Comics had the multiverse, the parallel Earth, separated by vibrations, and anything goes on any of those Earths because there's probably an infinite number out there. And then I remember around that same month of going through my you know, stepdad or uncle's comics and stuff. There's Deadpool, number 12 here of Exiles, that Reed Richards, I, I can't remember what comic it was, but Reed Richards was explaining, and I think they mentioned Vance Astro, a.k.a. Justice, uh, Vance Astro of the uh, Guardians of the Galaxy, that they were talking about parallel Earths, okay? Not parallel Earths, time divergent. As in, you can't really change time. All you do is anything you try to change, it just, like branches off and now you've created a new timeline where there's a whole other you know timeline going on there and that's how I understood both of them I mean Marvel still had the dimensions and all this stuff well you have the exiles here and they're going from earth to earth you know uh, parallel earth the multiverse the multiverse in um, you know Marvel and I always felt like this should have been a DC book why did DC not do this version of sliders in their um, you know, in their world. And, you know, they usually save the parallel Earth stuff for the Justice League, Justice Society, uh, occasional Superman, DC Comics Presents kind of thing, you know, Brave and the Bold every now and then. But uh, Exiles, uh, the only, the war, there was a storyline in the 70s. That's the only time in the, in the 70s issues, you know, I think it ran in the 60s to the mid 70s called World Tour. And they, visited the 2099 line, the future imperfect um, line with the Hulk and the Maestro and the New Universe. And, of course, you say New Universe, how I, I checked it out, and I was really impressed with what they did. So here in the last couple months, I've been running across these like crazy. Uh, different timelines. They mess with Wolverine, Spider-Man, uh, Ego the Living Planet. And I know there's fans out there like, uh, the first one that comes to mind is Ghost Critic. Um, and I know there's more out there, but, you know, that are fans of this book. And I've always been impressed with, uh, it seems like some of the best titles in a, in a DC or Marvel in the company are the ones that kind of do their own thing, and they're set up in a situation where they're not really connected with the rest of them. Uh, what comes to mind is like Jack Kirby's Commandy, Jack Kirby's Eternals, but they made Kirby drag the Eternals into the, original, into the main Marvel Universe. And then you have books like... Um, that whole Annihilation Conquest and Annihilation, the Cosmic books of the 2000s there with Keith Giffen coming on and Dan Abbott and Andy Lanning and all those guys. All that amazing stuff they had going on in there. And then all of a sudden we have a Guardians of the Galaxy movie. Um, you know, and Exiles is another one of those books. They don't get bogged down with the uh, continuity of one universe. They don't get drug into um, crossover events. And where the characters really aren't anywhere else and they're from different places, you can have some major character development, you know. And the last three here that I have, they're really uh, beat up a little bit. I didn't notice that until I got home, but I'm all right with it. It was like, you know, so there we go. <coughs> and then I was really impressed to find these. This is why I put a lot of stuff back. I found a crap load of Hellblazer in the 50 cent bins, and like I said, I got a deal on them. So I'm really proud because I probably have at least 200 issues of Hellblazer now. I could be wrong. And the only two that I, the only two that cost any real money is I got number one for five dollars. Number 
two for five dollars and the rest of them have been anywhere from 17 cents to 35 cents and when I do the math these will be right in there okay so there's number 21 um, number 69 really impressed to get that one and I flipped through some of these man wow Andy Diggle Mike Carey Garth Enos they did some great stuff man um, to issue 206 yeah you know you know why I'm doing that now so I cannot believe I found these and what was so funny is I was looking for a Heathcliff book yeah great stuff great stuff there's your Hellblazer George Breeze gambling I mean I got a good run here in the 230s at least too really good stuff art's amazing in these we're just a real creative book man I you know we go from case to case and screw over people uh -oh, we got a dog it's like he's pissing on somebody yep anyway and then here's the last bit of the out of the 50 cent bin I said in my last video look out I'll be doing some Legion of Superheroes this is the 2000 series that came out in 2005 that Mark Wade and Barry Kitson started and I was not impressed with and then all of a sudden in the 30s they brought back Jim Shooter uh, Jim Shooter did issue, I don't know, around 32 to issue 49, and then 50 with the way DC kept changing things on him. He did put his name on the book, and they had some mystery writer come up with a fake name to finish his run. But it's a big deal to have Jim Shooter return to the Legion of Superheroes because he started writing that book when he was like 13 or 14 or something. And then this is the 80s Baxter series. Uh, Paul Levitz, Keith Giffen, Greg LaRock, Steve Lytle. I would love to show you some art in these. These are cheap and real easy to find most places. But what amazed me was uh, I talked to a few of the retailers about a few things and kind of compared notes with what they're seeing. And a lot of the 80s stuff is starting to dry up. Uh, they said there are things that are selling that they wish they had brought with them because they've been stuck with boxes of them. Micronauts, Dazzler. Uh, Baxter series, Teen Titans, Legion stuff that like they just can't believe all this other stuff is selling. Here's some uh, Baxter series. This is the 1984 Baxter series of Teen Titans, bringing in the hybrid. And I always thought this kind of looked kooky. And I got in here and flipped through it and read a little bit of it. And that Gorg Gorgon, this guy Gorgon, now he's kind of an interesting character, you know. Number 26. Uh, that is Twister, and I'm just not a real big fan of her. I, she was this bad in the book as I thought she was going to be by looking at the cover the number 36 but what's going on is what I think is going on is the way that uh, comics from the big two have been in the last couple years I think a lot of people are giving up on them and they're going back to they're going back to the well and getting this good stuff all these older books and stuff you know uh, you know anyway and then this is the Legion sto uh, series that came out in 89 it was five years later in their continuity and there been a great big huge uh, you know, galactic war, and you know the Legion is no more. And this guy Roxas pops up, and he starts assassinating ex Legionnaires. They they use their real names. You, a lot of people didn't know who was who, and unless you were a major Legion fan. And this one is signed by Keith Giffen. Keith Giffen on the inside when I was slipping through it last night. Somebody had Keith Giffen signed issue number four of this, where Monel comes back and he's face to face with the Time Trapper. But as the uh, time went by with this book, you know, they kind of lightened it up and we got Legion of Superheroes proper and they brought out Legionnaires, you know, and then they rebooted it with Zero Hour again. So, you know, this, you know, like I said, I've just, I've always enjoyed, when you talk about diversity, Legion of Superheroes was ahead of the game. By the 80s, they had aliens, they uh, replaced, uh, they brought in the Invisible Kid, who was a black character, they had a uh, cop who was uh, transgender <coughs> and they might have recon retconned that I don't know um, you had a couple of the Legionnaires that kind of wonder if they were quietly gay you know so you know and what's kind of cool is that you see if you're a Legion fan you'll see some of these uh, characters pop up five years later and they've evolved and you're just kind of like oh cool and they went back and they did the Darkness Saga the sequel to the Darkness Saga with Darkseid that kind of brought a lot of attention to uh, the Legion of Superheroes in the early 80s. So, so there you go. I can't wait to read those. Cheap and good. Really satisfying. I think that's it, man. I've got another haul video I'm going to do because earlier I went to a Goodwill and I went to a library and got a lot of good stuff. Not 
no comics or anything, but some toys, some little novels, some VHS tapes. So, yeah, that's about it, man. All right, this is the awkward goodbye. We're ending the video, and you guys uh, go out there and, you know, have a good weekend.